Uh, my name is Arun Gupta. I work for Red Hat. I'm the director for developer advocacy, developer outreach, developer marketing, all of that stuff uh, at Red Hat. With that, I'm responsible for driving the developer um, outreach of anything JBoss middleware at Red Hat. Um, <coughs> this is the only marketing site where it has a Red Hat logo, nothing to do with um, <coughs> with there. Um, there are multiple ways to reach out to me. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter. Uh, if you are tweeting from here, so use that tag. Um, I've got a comprehensive blog, a previous blog, twice or thrice a week. And if you want to reach out to me, it's easy. Arungupta at redhat.com or at gmail.com. Both the IDs work. So today I'm going to talk about you know, how the application development landscape is changing, at least the way we are seeing in our customers and our partners. If you take a look at a typical monolith application, you know, um, your monolith application has a big honking wall. I'm talking about a Java EE application or a Spring application. Spring is much bigger anyway. Um, but if you're looking at a WAR file or an EO file, it typically has a UI component, a database component, a business logic component. Business logic is your EDB um, database, is your JPA layer, UI could be Java server faces, JavaScript, whatever. Now, you have lots of different components in there. They have their own caching layer. They, you know, they are persisting to the database. So that's your typical, very traditional enterprise application. Um, you can scale it, uh, yeah, you can run multiple you know, copies of that application. Um, you know, horizontal scaling, vertical scaling, multiple ways to do that. And then you front end it with a load balancer if you want to get that application you know, be easily accessible. Typically that's where you expose port 80 and then everything gets diverted to the multiple instances of the application running in the background. Now, in terms of Java EE, if you took at it, you know, it's your big one year, one year file. You know, with year, you have multiple wars, multiple jar files, and then you have multiple copies of that year file effectively running as multiple instances of the application server. Uh, cache and database still stays the same. So what are the advantages of this monolith application? Well, we have been building them for many, many years. Everything is kind of packaged up very nicely in one year file. Is that one single archive that you can, you know, check into your Nexus repository and say, I'm going to check it out and I know exactly that is a or one year file that is my deployment artifact. It's very easy to test because it takes a while for the year to start up, you know, in case of Spring all the more, because it's a 200 megabyte war file or a year file, but once those services are up, uh, then all those services are up and you can start testing your application. You are confirmed that everything that you need for the application will get started or will be started by the time the application is up. It's very simple to develop because your tools like NetBeans, Eclipse, IntelliJ, all those tools, they have been traditionally designed to cater to a traditional monolith application. You say, create a Java EE application, encrypt Java EE application for you, put in different services, it can easily allow you to integrate them together. Now, let's see, you know, I have version one of the application, this big monolith application, and I want to change a particular component, just one class file, or one component, or one database component of the application. How does it evolve? Well, uh, if you want to change business logic, so what you do? You create a big ear file again. Now notice in this case, UI, database, none of those components are changed, but this is one big monolith, so you have to build the whole war file again, and you say, go deploy it again, all right? Now, just the UI portion changes again. All right, so you then you deploy all over again. Now I'm talking in a very generic sense, but you can definitely optimize it. Say, hey, I have my CDN, all that stuff, you know, Apache front end, static files, blah blah blah. But traditionally, if you think about it, if you are upgrading any component of your Java enterprise application, you know, you are typically upgrading the entire EO file. Once again, just a JPA entity change, the whole WAR file or EO file gets deployed. So what are the disadvantages of such a monolith application in that case, right? So, but that makes it very difficult to deploy and maintain because, you know, think about the amount of time it takes to deploy an ear file. And God forbid if you're doing it on web sphere, you know, you deploy the war file, you go up for a coffee and you come back and you're lucky the war file is up. So, you know, that whole concept of deployment of an ear file becomes pretty annoying at a given point in time. You know, there were surveys have been done where on average developers are spending up to one man month on a deployment per year, you know, if you calculate over the time of you know, the life of an application. 
they're obstacle to frequent deployments because it's such a painful process to deploy an application. You know, it's such a time-consuming process. You know, you can't really deploy them frequently. So if you have a change, you know, you change the entire year file or war file, and you request for a deployment, and the whole thing has to go all over again. If it's going to take a few minutes, you know, what do you do during those two few minutes? Now, the other problem with this monolith application is because you are tied in to a particular stack, let's say Java EE, or say WebSphere, or WebLogic, or JBoss EAP, for any, any stack for that sake. But once you are stuck with the Java EE stack, you are stuck with it. Because you have made the architectural decisions that I'm going to go with JSF, I'm going to go with EJB, I'm going to go with CDI, I'm going to go with JPA. You start with those components. Um, if you want to change something, it's not easy. Yeah, it's possible, but it's not easy because all these components are really tied together with each other. They provide a cohesive programming model. Now, there's a beautiful book uh, by Martin Abbott and Michael Fisher. It's called as Art of Scalability. It talks about how to write scalable software. Um, and in this book, it presents a model where it talks about how the different ways applications can scale. So if you look at it, you know, in the x-axis, for example, um, it's a traditional scaling that we talk about, wherein you're running multiple copies of the application. Um, sticky stations, load balancer, all those simple concepts come in very handy for you. So you run uh, as many instances as you want, and that, allows, that gives you that scalability. Then there is z-axis scaling, which is quite like x-axis. You know, the same code is running, but it's dealing with a different set of data. So that's what we call as database sharding, for example. Oh, um, I'm a frequent flyer. Um, I'm going to be de I'm going to be given privilege, um, extra privileges. So I'm going to be dealt with a premium server. You are a normal flyer. I'm going to give you to a server which is slow response time. So that kind of stuff. So same logic, but dealing with a different set of data. And then the interesting concept here is where it talks about y-axis scaling which is the functional decomposition. So I guess you guys can understand where I'm going. I'm leading you towards a microservice-based architecture. Okay. Oh, okay. So microservice is sort of the latest fad. Um, I'm calling it a fad because you know, people are really trying to understand what microservice is. Uh, there are companies like Netflix, Etsy, Amazon, who have been doing microservices for many years. Um, essentially, uh, Martin Fowler, who is one of the key scientists at ThoughtWorks, defines uh, microservices in this beautiful article. Um, and all he says is, um, instead of taking one, one big WAR file or an ear file, you are creating your application as a suite of services. Okay? Um, the each service is independently deployable and scalable. They are talking to each other using well-defined interfaces. Um, the advantage is your, you know, because each service is independent, upgradable, and deployable, they can use whatever stack. Okay. That's a pretty dense you know, um, definition. So let's break it apart and look at what are the characteristics of microservices and what all things are required in order to be microservices enabled. So if you look at a classic application, again, okay, go back to our monolith application, you know, we have a UI, a database, and a persistence, and that's how Typically, if you look in an enterprise, that's how your teams are defined. Oh, this is a UI team, this is a database team, this is the business logic team. They know only how to write EJP, they write really good EJPs there. These are the database guys, we don't talk to them because these guys are nerdy. So, I mean, effectively, those are the teams. Given reality, what would we say? Now, if you want to generate a product or a project, so you know, your end goal is to deliver something to a customer, so which is orders, you know, order management, or shipping management or catalog management. That's your end goal. So all of these three teams, they may not like each other, they may love each other, but they all have to work together towards that common requirement. Okay, let's deliver, you know, a UI team is delivering in all these three different projects. Similarly, business logic is delivering in all these three projects. And data persistence is delivering in all these three projects. So that's kind of a typical mechanism how enterprise applications are built. Now, another statement that I would like to quote is by Melvin Conway, he's a beautiful scientist. You know, he was a beautiful scientist, and he says, any organization that designs a system, a system you know, more broadly defined than an information system, any system, is a copy of the organization's communication structure. So let's say you're defining an order management system, and if your teams are UI database persistence, no way you can have a you know, single code base you know, looking like a design by one team. 
This would really look like you know, designed by three different teams, patched up to work up together. So that's sort of the theory he proposed 15 years back. Unfortunately, his paper was rejected as the first uh, appliance, but then you know, people are realizing the importance of it. Um, so one of the first characteristic of microservice is how you are defining teams, not as UI database persistence team, you're defining teams around business capabilities. So your end goal, you know, your end goal is your customer. So if I say your customer is, you know, you want to deliver an order management system. So you say here's an order management system, you build a full stack team. Typically in Amazon, how many of you have heard of two pizza team with Amazon? So Amazon has this concept of a two pizza team. And what that means is any everybody and anybody in the team can be fed by two pizzas. Now, if you think about it, a pizza, a large pizza is about you know eight pieces. Um, large, you know, two large pizza is 16 pieces. So we're talking about like maybe eight people. So eight to ten is sort of a sweet spot on how you want to define your team around business capabilities. And that's a full stack team. What that means is in the orders team, for example, you have your UI persistence business logic, everybody in there. So that's one. Second is, you know, this is a uh, Bose 25 uh, surround sound system. Um, now, you can go to Fry's or any electronic shop and say, hey, I want an HDMI cable, or I want an RCA adapter, or I want an optical adapter. You can go to any standard electronic shop because these are well-defined interfaces. <coughs> that's exactly one of the characteristics of your microservice. Each service, you now if you want to deal with microservice, or order management, or a shipping management, or a catalog management, is a very explicitly defined interface. And that's the interface you talk with. Those interfaces are <coughs> defined very clearly uh, and published. And that's very important. Just like in this case, you know, here it's very clearly marked, oh, it's an HDMI, or this is a component, an output, or input, and all those things. So you just go to Fry's or any standard electronic shop, pick up the cable, and that just works out of the box for you. Another characteristic of microservice, I like giving analogies, that helps me understand better. Now, this is your typical wireless network. Um, you know, at the center is your wireless network, you've got your laptop, you've got your printer, you've got your desktop, servers, phones, everything connected with it. Now, the fact that your laptop goes rogue doesn't mean everything has to shut down and then the laptop needs to be upgraded. Similarly, if your server goes down, doesn't mean phone and everything has to shut down. So the point being, in this network, everything is independently upgradable and deployable. So I can just check off my phone here, you know, replace iPhone 5 with iPhone 6, and it's functional. I can check out the laptop and not even replace it. So that's my point. You know, in a microservice-based architecture, every service you know, is a well-defined interface, and that's the reason it's independently upgradable and deployable. So you keep that thing in mind. Any guesses? Where is the snapshot from? Spider-Man, excellent. So, uh, I, I generally get a good response to that. Uncle Ben said, with great power comes great responsibility. Now, one of the key characteristics of microservice is, if you are responsible for a microservice, like an order management system, and if you are delivering it, you are responsible for it, all the way till, not just get gets delivered, all the time it is running in production. So, that means you build it, you run it. So for example, in Netflix, um, developers can push out their feature any point of time in production, any point of time. But they know if the service goes down, it's not the DevOps, it's not the IT ops guy who's going to get a call at 3 in the morning, it's the developer who's going to get a call at 3 in the morning. Now, if you realize that fact that you may be called upon 2 or 3 in the morning, Sunday morning, Saturday morning, you will, you will be writing more responsible code. So that's an important aspect of it that your service only goes out of retirement until it's out of production. So once it's out of production, then it's retired, then you're not responsible for it anymore. But until it's running, until customers are accessing it, whether it's scalability, reliability, performance, management, all of that, you're responsible for it. Think about all the elegies of an application, you're responsible for it. Another aspect of microservice is, you know, failure is not Something um, is not a requirement. It, 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 it's a, a requirement. tolerance is a requirement. It's not a feature. In case of Netflix, I mean, uh, Netflix is one of the poster child for microservices. With Netflix, you know, and this is about two-year-old data, they receive a billion calls to Netflix per day because people are streaming. You know, at a given point of time on a Saturday night, 
Um, 33% of internet traffic is Netflix, of the entire internet traffic is Netflix. And this is when Netflix is not ever there in, in the entire world. Guess what happens when it goes all over the world? So, on a given day, um, Netflix receives a billion calls per day. Once they receive a billion calls, they fan out to about 6 billion calls on their network. Entire Netflix setup is running on Amazon EC2. So, each call is talking to dozens of systems. So think about a few billion calls being made per day, running on Amazon. So fault tolerance is a feature over there. You know, you have to write a service which is able to adapt if things break. So that's where you know, Netflix, a uh, Simian army is very, very familiar. You know, um, this is um, called as a monkey chaos uh, as part of Netflix. Um, I would request you to read an article on that. And all they do is, for a system running in production, they just randomly pull the power cord. See what happens. Pull, pull the power cord. Now, just kill a process. See how it recovers nicely. Um, so something that is useful for that is Hystrix. Um, is one of the Netflix uh, open source library, which is um, uses the circuit breaker pattern. I would request you to read again on that. But it allows you to build a fault-tolerant microservice. Any guesses on this? Where is this from? Any space fans here? This is Apollo 13. Excellent. Yeah, this is Apollo 13. Now, Apollo 13 was one of the very typical missions from NASA uh, many years ago. And they had a problem when they were up in the space. Their carbon dioxide level, the oxygen level was same, but carbon dioxide level was going up because their um, device, which was sucking up carbon dioxide, wasn't behaving properly. So really, what they had to do was they had this round hole and they had to fit in a, they had to fit a square peg in this round hole. Now, if you're using, you know, uh, I'm not criticizing Java EE in any sense, I would never do that, but if you are stuck with Java EE, for example, you are stuck with it, you know, in a monolith application. Um, if you wanna, if you marry to a relational database, you will continue using that, you will try to shove in your, you know, graph database into your MySQL or Oracle, whatever it is, and you will adapt to that, and your application architecture will evolve with that. With microservice, because you're using you know, a two-pizza you know, you know, two team, you know, there are eight to 10 people who are working on it, it can, it can truly be polyglot. It doesn't need to be polyglot, but it can truly be polyglot. And when I say polyglot, I mean in all senses, whether it's language, whether it's database, whether it's application server, you're completely independent because you are responsible for running it. You, def you define what is your, I mean, your full stack team. So you define how it needs to be structured. So you can choose, for example, say Java and JavaScript, and then you can say, hey, I need only a graph database, I'm going to pick Cassandra, and I'm going to deploy on Wildfly. Or I'm going to pick, pick Node.js, whatever it is. So you're completely independent, because remember, the implementation details in your case are not visible to anybody. You're talking using well-defined interfaces. So all those components, all those characteristics that are defined, they actually come together um, all together. Another characteristic of this, and in a given month, um, I make payments to um, my Gardner, uh, my JCPenney card, my Macy's card, my car payments, my mortgage, hundreds of payments go in a month. I can't keep writing checks. I don't even remember when did I write my last check. This is, uh, not my account, but this is how Wells Fargo, which is my bank back in the US, their bill payment statement. And it's all automated. Um, I just schedule the payment, and it just happens every month. And I get an email notification, payment made. So that's again one of the important characteristics. Because you want the service to be resilient, to be independent, you have to make it 100% automated. So that you know, fault tolerance, so if it fails, you know, it, it knows exactly what to fall back to. So the, some of the very important characteristics that you need to remember. Some of the messaging styles that you need to be aware of. Now, this is a very classic phone. I remember this from many, many years ago. Um, but the two classic messaging styles, the more prominent one is, of course, um, um, a, a synchronous one, where you know you call a person and he responds back, or if the person doesn't pick up the phone, you know the person is not available. The other more modern one is async messaging, what we call as email. You send an email, the person receives a message, they respond to you know, whenever he gets to the main tool. Um, so in terms of microservices, your characteristic over there is REST-based endpoint. Um, so your interfaces are published using get, put, post, delete, standard HTTP works, or um, you can, um, in order to achieve scalability, 
you know, because the server could be down, you may not be able to respond to it right away, you build using a, a message queue. So you, you might have like a active end queue or something running in the middle as a broker, there's a publisher, and then the consumers now who are interacting with how these messages are exchanged. Last but not the least characteristic of microservices is smart endpoints, dumb pipes. All the business logic is expected to be contained within uh, the endpoint itself. You know, this basically going against the philosophy of enterprise service bus, which you know, deploys complex logic, routing mechanisms, all of those within um, the bus itself. So that's the important part. You know, I mean, the endpoint has all the logic. Bus is only used to transfer the data from point A to point B. Guess what happens? You know, you know, if you know, I mean, if there are local buses here, if the buses start, you know, changing your clothes or putting hats on you while you're sitting in a bus, you know, here. So, what is your strategy? You know, if you're doing a traditional monolithic application, what is your strategy for decomposing? Well, take a look at it. You know, first is take a look at the verbs in your application architecture. So, check out. Okay, check out is going to be my one microservice in that case. Um, take a look at now. You know, um, my catalog is going to be a service. So, start looking at verbs and nouns. Um, excellent. Uh, Example of microservice comes from Unix utilities. Now, if you say ls, it just ls. It's just one thing, and it does that one thing very, very good. Um, you can pipe it. You can say ls pipe grab for a particular name. Grab does that thing very, very well. No matter where the data is coming from, where the data is going to. So, I mean, we use microservices in that sense on a daily basis. You know, we uh, how many? Okay, how many of you have not used the ls command on a Unix box? You have not used, not used. No. See, everybody. So everybody has used microservices in that sense on a daily sense. Is is just putting a perspective to that. You know how these microservices you know, we've been using for years, um, and they are able to pipe you know well-defined interfaces. They fail very gracefully, things like that. So uh, here is my uh, big honking war file. I figured out my checkout service is reusable. I'm going to extract it out you know as a separate war file, and because it's a full stack service, so uh, service A will have its own cache and database layer. Here will continue to have its own database layer. They can independently scale on their own, like you know, either on x-axis or on y-axis or z-axis scaling we talked about earlier, and they will still have a load balancer in front of it. Some of the design patterns that are important when you're building a microservice-based architecture. So first is called as an aggregator pattern. So now let's say you have service A, service B, service C. Um, three different services, but to the customer, you want to provide a unified portal. Well, they have their own caching and database layer. So you have an aggregator service in the front end. From the load balancer, you talk to that aggregator service. The aggregator service, in turn, knows exactly which services to talk to. It aggregates the results from those three services and returns the response. Because to the client, you don't want to expose the architecture of there are like multiple services. Because remember, each service is independently upgradable and deployable. <coughs> And the aggregator then again could scale on Y scaling or Z scaling or X scaling. Proxy pattern where um, you just receive a request, and I call it as 1.5 because it's very much similar like aggregator pattern. Instead of aggregating from these different services, it recognizes where I need to proxy it, and it just proxies it to the right service. The second pattern that I want to talk about is a chain pattern. So now you receive a service. Service A is the one that receives a request from the load balancer, and it had, again it has its own caching and database layer. Service A is talking to service B, which is then talking to service C. So again, you, know, you can define how your service flow is going to look like, and I'm talking in terms of very generic services here. Branch pattern. So now you receive a request, service A receives a request, and based upon the user workflow, it may say I'm going to call service B, or I'm going to call service C and D, which are sitting in a separate chain. And again, these are defined as part of your application architecture itself. Another pattern over there is within the chain, for example, we talked about how they could have their own caching and database layer, but you know, having multiple schemas is a nightmare to any DBA in that sense. So you may say, oh, you know what, these two services, by the way, are going to share the schema because they have so much in common, and I'm going to be in big trouble if I really start spreading the database over there. So a shared resources is very much a given reality, although ideal for each service to have its own caching and database there, but this is a practical reality. 
another concept, you know, in all the patterns so far, the users are all using REST-based uh, message exchange pattern. You can also use async messaging. So then you say, load balance service, service A receives a request, and it's calling to service C, um, which is then publishing messages to Q, and then consuming messages from different services as well. So there are lots of different messaging patterns. And again, these are some of the messaging patterns that we have come up with. I'm working on a white paper to explain these. So hopefully you'll learn more details about this. So based upon what we've talked about so far, what are the advantages of microservices as well? They're easier to develop, understand, and maintain because you know, it's a very defined scope. Uh, they start faster than a monolith because, um, again, the size of the war file or the ear file is much smaller. Uh, the uh, local change can be easily deployed because they're talking through well-defined interfaces. So I'm going to talk about continuous deployment in a second, but they're a great enabler on how you can have your application in a DevOps state where it's always in a continuous deployment mechanism. Each service can scale independently. We talked about x-axis and not z, but rather uh, not y, but z-axis. They can scale independently on their own axis. Uh, it allows you to improve fault isolation. And if a service fails, you know you know which is the war file you need to look into, rather than going through the entire stack trace on how these things are happening. Uh, another very important part is you know you're not tied to any particular technology stack uh, you know, for the long term. And then, of course, you have a freedom of choice. You know, whatever tools, technologies, and framework. There's a wonderful paper on InfoQ uh, on how Netflix does microservice. I would you know, recommend to read that. It explains you know, what are the different tools and techniques they use over there. Now, most of the people, you know, I would say 99.9% .9 actually rather, are building big monolithic applications. So the fact, uh, this is again a beautiful statement um, on coding the architecture blog. It says, if you can't build a well-structured monolith, don't expect to build a microservice architecture right away. Now, if you are, uh, I remember you know, I talked to a customer a few years ago, uh, their entire website was one big JSP. UI, model, view controller, everything jammed into those 50,000 lines. Yeah, it is possible. I can jam Java code in there, I can jam persistence, I can create transactions, all of that. Why is possible? Is that a microservice? No way. Is it be, will it be easy to convert that into a microservice? No way. So I think the key part that you want to think about is when you're building your monolithic application, you always want to keep in mind that even when I'm building my monolithic applications, am I following good design patterns? You know, um, am I segregating the process in packages? Am I using you know entity control boundary pattern? You know, am I using the recommended design patterns? With that in the mind, it will be easier for you to migrate over to a microservice-based architecture. Now, microservice, 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 but it's not a panacea. What are the drawbacks? What are the typical uh, um, uh, use cases for microservices? People talk about how you are really pushing the problem from your monolith application to you know, a different layer, like you know, smart endpoint, dumb pipe, but are you really pushing the problem on the pipe, basically? So with a microservice, you need a very complex distributed system, which is actually working over there. So you're really pushing the problem up on the networking layer. You need a significant operational complexity. So again, once you go back and read the Netflix paper, you will understand um, how complex architecture and trade. It's not easy to write those libraries. Not everybody is Netflix and can invest in that. Amazon, on a given day, um, if you look at Amazon Web Services, they're doing 10,000 deployments. Um, but that's been over a period of years now. Okay? Um, you got to have a rollout plan because the services have well-defined interfaces. What if you're upgrading the service? Changing to a new schema, the interface is changing. How do you identify everybody else that I'm moving to a new schema? So it does require that additional complexity. And if you're a startup company, are you willing to invest into microservice right away? Probably not, because monolithics are still the easiest way to start. Uh, because microservice require a little bit of upfront investment, and then it becomes a little bit involving and daunting to actually start with microservice. But by the time you realize, oh, I'm ready to go microservice, your monolith is truly a big monolith. And then it becomes difficult. So it's sort of a you know, catch-22 situation always. Switch gears. Now, um, how many of you are, um, how many of you consider yourselves as developers? Okay. How many of you are considering yourselves as IT ops? Okay, so this would be very familiar in that case. The typical way things work, you know, developers build the app and they throw it over the wall, 
I'm done. And now the IT ops is going to deal with it in the production. If anything fails, it's the IT ops problem. If the app doesn't perform, um, if there are performance issues, if the database crashes, it's the IT ops problem. And that's the wrong mindset. That's the, purely the wrong mindset. <coughs> the old testament, you know, the old belief, um, which we have been do all doing it all along, is oh, Dev's job is to always add the latest and the greatest features in there, and IT ops job is to keep the site stable and fast. Um, and I say site, but it's really the project or the service or the monolith application we talk about. Well, ops job is not to keep site stable and fast. That's not their primary job. The primary job is to enable the business so that at the end of the day, you can all make money. Whether it's developers, whether it's ops, your stock goes high, hopefully. And so is devs. So essentially, DevOps is a happy marriage between the dev and the ops. That's a very, very important part. You know, it's dev and ops working together. A marriage won't be successful if the husband and wife are fighting all the time. Wife gonna throw something over to the husband and her husband like, oh, I'm done. I don't know how you're gonna deal with it. Your problem. It's not going to work that way. So it's a very, it is supposed to be a happy marriage in that sense. Now, you ask different people, what is DevOps? Everybody has a different definition. There are 500 definitions that are floating around of DevOps. You know, you ask a developer, yeah, I build an application, that's DevOps. Oh, I'm an IT guy, you know, I put this app in production, that's uh, DevOps. So let's sort of all agree on a unified definition of DevOps, which is actually very well defined uh, by Jess Humboldt. He's the guy who wrote the book on continuous delivery. It's called as a DevOps manifesto. So there are URLs at the bottom of the screen, uh, but there are key points that I want to highlight here is, first of all, DevOps is a reaction to poor communication between dev and ops. You know, um, how many times the dev and the ops are talking to each other about the requirements? The, I mean, dev finishes 90% of their cycle, and then they start talking to ops. Oh, by the way, my, op, my app is ready to go to production, let's talk. And ops say, yeah, you know what, you do this development stuff, we don't care about it. Let us know when the app is ready and then we'll deal with it. So th that's truly the model which leads to failure several times. So it's really a reaction to that poor communication. And as a real result of that communication, it increases the transparency between both the dev, dev guys and the ops guys. So the dev and the ops are working uh, to solve and enable business from the day one. You know. During the development, during the design time itself, ops guys are actually heavily involved. Oh, by the way, this app is going to go into production, and this is the performance requirements for it, and how that needs to happen. Um, if you give a um, archive to somebody and say deploy the application, and you say like, you know, here are these 20 different instructions that you need to follow, humans are bound to err, bound to err, 100% bound to err. So. Um, the, one of the big philosophies of DevOps is automation over documentation. So script it, script it, script it. You know? Computers are dumb, but they're really smart, and they tell them the same thing to do. They'll do that same thing again and again really well. Humans can't do that. Um, another important aspect of DevOps is, you know, uh, is creating a self-service infrastructure. So for example, in Netflix, um, as we talk about, any developer is willing to, uh, any, de uh, any developer is allowed to provision infrastructure at any point of time. And the way they do that is, um, uh, they just go to a console that they have, and they say, you know what, I want to provision 5,000 Amazon instances. Everybody can do that. They don't need to go to an IT and say, oh, by the way, provision. No, this is a completely self-service infrastructure. And the last but not the la uh, least part is, as I talked about earlier, an uh, app is not done until it's retired from production. So you build it, you run it. Remember Uncle Ben, always remember him. So is DevOps really for you? Well, this is one of the statistics, and this is about a couple of years old statistics, which says um, people who are using DevOps, uh, they ship code 30 times faster, and they have 50 times, 50% uh, fewer failures. Uh, so in order to summarize what DevOps is, I like to call them as five C's of DevOps. The first is, um, a very important aspect is a collaboration between developer and the operations people. Second is, which is, Probably the biggest bottleneck is the culture change in a company. That's the biggest uh, thing here. Third one is still very easy. You, can, you need to code everything. Uh, don't rely on any human for running a script. It should be 100% automated. You know, just write a cron job to run the script. Don't tell a human, oh, run the script at 2 o'clock. Oh, guess what? I, I was drinking coffee. I forgot about it. Of course. Um, um, again, co 
consistency, repeatability that comes from automation over documentation, um, and continuous delivery. So let's talk about some of these things a little bit. Um, when I say dev, I mean everybody involved in the development side. PM, you know, uh, product manager, development, engineering manager, all of those guys. When I mean the op side, I mean everybody on the op side. You know, the guy who provisions the infrastructure, the guy who runs the network, the guy who set up the security certificates, everybody. Everybody has to have a stake in the game, and they need to work together to make sure the app is successful, because that's the end goal. If it doesn't work, it should not be like, you know what, it's a dev problem and an ops problem. No finger pointing. Culture change, in my opinion, is the biggest uh, bottleneck for DevOps uh, adoption. So for example, you need to respect, you know, if an ops is giving you feedback early in the dev cycle, that don't write code like that, because this could cause issues in the production, respect it. Just because you know, you're a rock star programmer doesn't mean you can write bad code. You can, you likely will, because you are running by your own ego. Um, so respect other person's uh, opinion. Similarly, if a dev is telling you that don't deploy the app on such and such infrastructure, listen to that. So respect each other's opinions and um, expertise. Um, ops need to think like devs, devs need to think like ops, you know, from the day one itself, when the app is into building process itself. So this leads to a lot more transparency. If a failure happens, don't ignore it. Oh, this happened and I don't know what to do with it. Then you want to build a joint recovery plan. Oh, by the way, let's figure out you know, what happened. And I'll talk a little, a little bit about this a little bit more. But once a failure happens, figure out what happened, build a joint recovery plan so that it doesn't happen again. And again, script it. Don't expect a human to intervene. Um, amplify the feedback loops earlier in the cycle. If there's something that's happening you know, as a failure or bound to occur as a failure, stop talking about it. You know? Just, just don't be hush hush about it. So uh, this is a beautiful um, slide that I found out, um, which is from Flickr. Um, I don't know if it's probably not really. Can we turn off these lights here? Oh, perfect. Okay. So here it says oh, problem identified. So the first thing you do is you freak out. Oh shoot, problem identified. Let me find out who can I point the finger at. Who can I fire? Let me fire a sh shoulder. And you start blaming, you cover your ass, you whine, 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 you go get drunk, whatever you do. Finally, you figure it out because you know it's a problem, it needs to be fixed, and you figure it out, and you fix it. Okay? So that's called as a finger pointiness. On the other side, you do be productive. Oh, problem identified, you figure it out, you fix it, then you do all that, you know, you feel guilty, whatever, you know, life goes on. So think about what approach, what model your team fits in. I hope it's not the top one, but Given where we are, I think it's a lot more on the top side. My uh, one of my managers, you know, she was my one of my ex-managers at Oracle. She said, "Treat people warmly, issues coldly," which is which is I really took to my heart. You know, if you if somebody files a bug on your software, don't start go thrashing them. How dare you file a bug on my project? This is like nonsense. You know, you don't know this. You know, this is not a bug. Don't close the bug right away. It's a bug. Deal with it. Software. It's, there's bu bugs bound to happen. So just go fix it, man. And you know, if you're gonna treat people, don't treat people coldly and issue warmly. Issue is gonna go away. Treating people coldly will not go away. Uh, another C of DevOps is code everything. And I say everything. I mean everything. Um, application, database schema, cron cron jobs, name it. Provisioning scripts, test data. Everything, you know, database provisioning, everything, 100% coding, and change into uh, source code control. Another example, I met a customer last year um, in Delhi. Um, I asked, what is your testing process? Oh, um, there's a lead developer, um, he has the workspace on his laptop, uh, no source code control, um, and he right clicks in Eclipse, he generates a WAR file, and he mails it to the testing team, the testing team tests it, when they're ready, they mail it to the uh, to the ops team, and then they go to production. So what happens if there's a failure? Oh yeah, that's okay. We just go back. We just email patches back and forth. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I hope you guys are not like that, but I've seen a lot of customers like that. So important part is code everything, but check in everything into a source code control. And that's where you know, um, Agent Smith is very useful. It says never send a human to do a machine's job. Because machines, as I said earlier, are dumb, but they are really good at repetitive tasks. So if you code everything, if you automate everything, they will really do that thing again and again and again really well. 
Um, consistency again comes from automation over documentation. Um, repeatability is very important. So at a given point of time, if I give you a tag, you should be able to say, this is my dev test prod, dev test prod. You know, I should be able to do that 100, 200 times without a fail, repeatable, again and again. Um, push button deployments is really the thing that we're looking for. We all dream for that, but there are multiple steps towards push button deployments. Um, managing environments, you know, it's very important, whether it's dev, test, or prod, I'll talk about that in a second. The important part here is, if you don't do this well, guess what's going to happen in your crash test? You're going to fail big time. You're going to have a head-on collision, and you're going to crash. Um, there are lots of different ways by which you manage environments. Uh, if you're using uh, cloud, you know, of course, PaaS is the typical way. So OpenShift uh, is a Red Hat's product where we use it pretty heavily for all of these uh, DevOps. Uh, there are lots of different ways for virtualization. Uh, Vagrant is pretty popular. Um, Containers, there are lots of them, Docker, Kubernetes, Rocket, uh, name it. In terms of uh, app server, of course, JBoss EAP is from Red Hat. Um, in terms of configuration tools, I've seen a whole variety, Puppet Chef, Ansible, Sol, a whole group variety, and orchestration tools as well. Pretty much the last topic in terms of is continuous delivery, which is sort of the crescendo of DevOps, which is what we are shooting for here. Uh, now. Um, how many of you have read Agile Manifesto? Some of you, yeah. So I would recommend, again, look at that, Google for Agile Manifesto, read through it. Uh, it kind of highlights some of the key points over here. You know, it prefers individuals and interactions over processes and tools. So build a warm relationship. Remember what I said? Warm people, cold issues. So it kind of highlights some of those aspects over there. Uh, continuous integration. How many of you have continuous integration set up in your projects? That's good, yeah, it's a good, good 80% of the hands. Uh, fail fast and recover. You know, if there's a failure, again, we talked about you know, how Netflix is doing it. If a service fails, let it fail, cool, quick recover. You know, just build a joint recovery plan. What happened? You know, let's kind of diagnose the issue, fix it, and move on. Um, Self-service architecture is very, very important. It's 100% automation we talked about. I was talking to a friend of mine, uh, works at Amazon, and he says, if you want to do continuous delivery, one of the most important pieces for continuous delivery is your proactive monitoring and metrics. So that you understand what went wrong, and then you can take corrective action on that. So um, quick uh, highlight between sort of continuous integration, deployment, and uh, delivery and deployment, okay? So continuous integration is test, build, deploy. Um, every time you commit, you, know, you check in into a workspace on a git push, for example, there's a CI server running. It's going to check out the entire workspace for you, build the whole thing. And run tests on it and push push it into deployment if need be. But really, um, the basic basic continuous integration is build and deploy. That's what it is. So it helps you identify issues earlier in the cycle. Then comes continuous delivery, where you say, oh, by the way, um, I'm going to say build deployment test, and I'm going to say manual acceptance, user acceptance testing. Um, so each build is possibly a release candidate. <coughs> When I say test, I put this in one big bubble, but essentially, you know, you can have a whole variety of um, uh, testing here. Uh, usability testing, performance testing, regression testing, scalability testing, longevity testing, all those testing can happen here. And then finally, UAT, and then into release. Continuous deployment is where you say everything is 100% automated, even user acceptance testing. Those are what are called as a push button deployments. Now, the customers and the partners and the developers I talk to, most of them are here. Some of them are here. Nobody goes over here generally because you know, there are requirements, business requirements, which requires you to manually check something. Um, I blogged about this. This is what I call as a continuous uh, deployment maturity matrix. Uh, these are CMMI levels, initial, managed, defined. You know, there are five different levels that are defined by Carnegie Mellon University. And these are different aspects of continuous delivery. So culture and organization, you know, so on and so forth. So the idea is you can take a look at the continuous delivery maturity matrix, see where you fit at different levels, kind of checkbox over there. And then you say, hey, by the way, my goal is to go uh, down the matrix. I'm going to keep evolving till I reach the optimizing level. So at least this is sort of a good sanity check for yourself. This is the book that I was talking about earlier on continuous delivery. Um, effectively, they say, how do you get into a continuous delivery mechanism is by building a deployment pipeline. 
Um, and deployment pipeline is nothing but an end-to-end -end automation of your build, deploy, test, and release cycle. So um, OpenShift, which I talked about, is Red Hat's uh, premier platform, uh, open source platform, PaaS application platform. So on OpenShift, you can easily build, this is using Jenkins on OpenShift, you can easily build a deployment pipeline. And this is a visualization of that deployment pipeline. So here, for example, you're saying, this is the commit stage, this is the acceptance stage, this is the UAT stage, and this is the production stage. Um, this is pipeline number 16. Effectively, this is each pipeline, each instance of pipeline is triggered by a git push. You do a git push, it goes through this entire cycle, everything is automated. At any point, the deployment fails. I don't have a failure scenario here. But at any point, a deployment fails, it's going to break the pipeline over there, it's not going to go further down. So that's the way deployment pipeline is set up. And I'm actually working on a blog series which is going to highlight how you can set up this deployment pipeline by yourself. Last slide. Um, whether you are doing microservices, whether you are building a DevOps-centric architecture, whether you are doing continuous delivery, there are lots of tools by Red Hat which really enables you to do that. So uh, JBoss Tools is the uh, set of Eclipse plugins which allows you to build enterprise Java applications very easily. Um, this is, this is JBoss Developer Studio. Wildfly is Red Hat's Java E compliant application server. Um, InfiniSpan is the caching uh, layer. Hibernate, we all know, is a persistence layer. Uh, AeroGear allows you to build uh, portable mobile applications. Vertex allows you to write reactive applications and truly polyglot. So Groovy, Java, Scala, all those kind of applications can be very easily written. REST Easy is our REST implementation for JAX RS. Um, Feed Henry, again, is a mobile backend, as a service. So there are lots of different tools from Red Hat that allows you to write a microservice-based architecture and help you with DevOps. And of course, last, not, last but not the least is OpenShift, where you know, you can, anybody can go to openshift.com, sign up for an account, and set up the deployment pipeline as I talked about. Right, I think that's the end of my talk. Um,